Okay, so I guess we'll go ahead. Um, it's okay with everybody. We'll go ahead and um, call the meeting to order. And then um, um, when um, Susie gets available, then she can join us. So um, I'm not going to do roll call, um, Joanne, unless you want me to, but I think you can see everybody's little face. Um, no, I, I've got it. Thank you, though. Okay. okay. Um, so the first thing is to look at the minutes from last time. Um, does anyone have any corrections or um, comments? I move we uh, approve the minutes as distributed. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Thomas. And all in favor of approving the minutes from October, or sorry, not from October, from September as uh, written, say aye or wave your hand or something. Um, all, the, all opposed? Okay, so that looks like an unanimous um, vote to me. Thank you very much. Um, I guess we're up to you, Eric, with the proposed accessions for October. All right, well, Steph, do you have the PowerPoint that you can share? Great. All right, so we have quite a number of accessions this month. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so the first one is uh, the largest of the ones for this month. It is um, several boxes worth, uh, primarily archival material um, relating to the Carroll family. Um, they were um, lived in Longmont from 19 teens to the early 1940s, um, owned Carroll Pharmacy and um, Lauren Carroll was very involved in the Elks. There's a number of photographs of the Elks band. Um, and it's, it's generally a, a nice photographic collection within some additional uh, certificates and so forth that tie to the collection. Um, so that is the Carroll family collection. Uh, we can go ahead, go to the next slide. Um, so the next several accessions relate to our um, project on sending out a call for collections related to the ongoing uh, COVID situation. And I believe we have seven uh, total collections related to digital photographs. Um, so the two on this page, one of a woman wearing a hand-sewn COVID mask, Another, uh, it's actually an art in public places sculpture uh, that someone has placed a COVID mask on. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, healthcare worker, again, wearing uh, COVID masks. And um, then several uh, photographs of various aspects of COVID. So empty store shelves, uh, uh, cordoned off playgrounds, um, celebrating that they could actually find toilet paper. Um, there's also, which I couldn't really show you in the PowerPoint, but a brief digital video of a flyover, one of the jet flyovers that was found in Longmont. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, so then we have some photographs related primarily to the mask project that uh, Ann Mack at the museum headed up, and then also a couple photographs of the Black Lives Matter protests at Roosevelt Park. Um, next one is a participant in the virtual Boulder Boulder. The uh, person uh, depicted had participated nearly every Boulder Boulder, um, and so was very disappointed when it was canceled, and so uh, decided to participate virtually. Um, and then there was also a Zoom birthday party uh, screen capture of that. So that was kind of cool. Um, next slide. And this is our last uh, COVID-related collection. Um, 
This one relates a little more to kind of the, the personal stories. Um, so photographs of schools, um, the signs are, um, the donor called them kind of family harmony, things they could post on the doors to say either, don't bother me or yes, it's fine to come in, that kind of thing. And then the um, one in the lower right corner is um, kind of a touching story. They went to retrieve their daughter from Georgetown University after it had closed and you know, could only bring home a couple of suitcases. Um, and so the suitcases are actually sitting outside while they're, you know, hopefully the sunlight is killing off the COVID uh, that might be on them. So um, those are all of the uh, COVID related uh, collections. So any questions on any of that? I know it's, it's quite a lot of, of collections, um, but uh, certainly if anyone has any thoughts or questions about kind of that contemporary collecting aspect, we haven't done a lot of it in recent years, but um, with COVID, we thought it was appropriate to do it. So Eric, will you be continuing to collect things as it seems appropriate, as obviously this isn't over yet? So, um, yes, there's actually a couple more collections that are still um, kind of being processed uh, related to COVID. And then at some point, and I'm not, we're sort of trying to figure out when we could safely do that, we would probably open up a call for um, 3D artifacts as well. Um, I talked to, I talked to the curator at Lakewood and said, They've kind of had the same experience. People were willing to share digital photos, but really not 3D objects like masks. Everybody's still using their masks. So, uh, but yes, the thought is certainly we would continue to do uh, collecting in the future and maybe do another call uh, sort of if it gets to be a point where it starts to feel like we're on the you know, tail end of it and people maybe have a little more perspective that, that we might um, put out another call for. Uh, for collections. Great, thanks. I have a question, it's Tom. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, regarding uh, all the COVID stuff, um, and you know, you've included BLM, which really wasn't COVID related, but it happened during the same time. And my question was, wasn't, are you going to try to include, since you've included the BLM stuff, are you gonna to try to include anything, Eric, for Blue Lives Matter, which is kind of, uh, you know, there's been some, um, there's been some um, advocation, advocations of those things too in different parts of the state, but I can't remember if there was something actually in long run that occurred. I know there was up in Bertha and a few other towns. So yeah, we would certainly be open to uh, Blue Lives Matter um, donations. It, it, we're really at this point kind of um, limited in what people have offered us. So okay. that's, that's certainly something that uh, if we put out another call, we could, we could certainly indicate that because um, I think we actually put out the first call before uh, even the Black Lives Matter protests had really started and wow. um, just what people were, were sending yeah. in. Yeah, it was just a question since that was included. It seems like you should include the other half, the other side too. <laughs> somewhere. Um, yeah, certainly we, we would, we would want to document anything relating to Longmont that people feel like was, was significant happening during this time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Can I interject before we move on? This is Council Member Hidalgo Faring. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, so I think I wanted to provide a little perspective on the um, notion of the Blue Lives Matter or the thin blue line and, and really looking at it not as an opposition to Black Lives Matter, but it is its own separate entity. Yeah, so and I the thing is, is that I excuse me, excuse. Excuse me. Can I finish? 
best choice of words. No, that's all right. Um, so, but I wanted to kind of add some context. So last, um, last Friday, I had a conversation with our, um, the president of the FOP, the Fraternal Order of Police. And then additionally, we had lunch together on Monday. So really it was talking around the social justice work, the, um, the, what the perception of the, the thin blue line means um, and over the years. So how it originated. So we really went back and looked at history. We looked at how, how it's become an issue of now it is because this Black Lives Matter comes out, oh, well, Blue Lives Matters too. And it, it, we need to go, we, you know, really wanting to look beyond that, that aspect of valuing Black Lives Matter for what it means, and it is a social justice um, issue. So the other thing is, so back in 2016, not long after Black Lives Matter started to emerge, I was at an, um, a National Education Association conference where we had a panel and they were, it was the women who started that movement, that hashtag. And really what they, what the reason why they brought that forward was because of the police brutality, things that were happening of um, black youth, um, black, predominantly black men who were getting beaten up and assaulted by, peop by law enforcement. And so what that meant. So we had a really good conversation with the president of the Fraternal Order of Police. So he's the president of the police union and really talking about what that means and that perspective. So I wanna make sure that if we do bring in artifacts from that include um, the thin blue line or the flag with the blue line, that it comes with context. And so really talking about the, um, what the impacts that it had on, has on some individuals in our community. For some individuals in our community, especially our community of color, our black and brown residents, they, they, it feels like a very intimidating view. So looking at it and, and just having this sense of intimidation or threat or threat. And so one of the things that I spoke with Stephen about is really reclaiming that. And um, so if that was a notion of having police pride, then we need to make sure that the whole community feels that sense of, of pride. So, um, you know, I want to be careful that when we start adding in different, um, so like I think about the Black Lives Matter. So we had the protest, we were protesting, this, this was a sign of the times, protesting for social justice, equity, um, you know, just really making sure that everybody, um, you know, that, that we, are, we are thinking about our, our black and brown um, community members who have felt under attack from racist attacks, um, you know, just kind of verbal, verbal abuse, things that we've dealt with um, over the years. So it's kind of bringing that piece to light. So I think because there's been organized rallies, we wanna make sure that, that that piece is included when we bring in Blue Lives Matter, because I've also seen rallies around that, but really making sure that the context is there. So, and why, maybe why the opposition was there. So really bringing in that historical component and what it means. Um, one of the things that I'm working with public safety on is implicit bias and cultural proficiency and looking at impacts versus intent. So sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm doing this, this piece or I'm, I'm advocating for this, you know, all lives matter. Okay, yeah, of course all lives matter. Nobody's saying it's not but the impact that it has is that you're devaluing other people of color who've been oppressed, who felt very oppressed over the years. So making sure that all those, all that context is brought to light. And I hope that I, I kind of added some clarity and not confusion to this because <laughs> it's a long topic. <laughs> yeah, I've been studying this work for the last 30 years too. So <laughs> it's been part of my world. So. Okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thomas, uh, you are muted, by the way. You may want to unmute. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I said I totally agree with you. Uh, uh, I think, but you know, I think both, um, view, both, both groups need to be, if we're gonna talk about one, I think we should talk about the other a little bit historically 
if that's what the purpose is. I don't think we can really talk about one and not the other. So, and then I don't know if you caught what I had said, because I also said that that's important to have if we have yeah, oh yeah. things. No, I'm just, we, but we also need to have, make sure well, it has context. It, it has yeah. context to it. Yeah, I do, totally agree. And I, uh, I mean, I was muted when I said, I thought, you know, that I totally agreed with you. Um, I just didn't want us to forget about it uh, either. And uh, uh, that's why I brought it up. Because I think it reminded me because I think I've seen the city and I don't know how it's related to all of it, but it was requesting membership uh, people to membership for kind of a police over and I won't say oversight committee, but a, a police uh, committee uh, to the to review certain things with the police department. I mean, this I read this a couple weeks ago, so it's not real clear in my mind. So I, I think uh, that made me think about it when I saw, when I was looking at these uh, exhibits. Sure. Yeah, th thank you both. That's very, um, very helpful discussion. Uh, Thanks, Eric. Oh, Eve, I think you're muted. Am I muted again? Oh no, I'm I'm just talking away and I'm on mute. Um, <laughs> sorry. I, what what this brings up to me too is that I think, and I'm, you're, Eric, you're very good at this, but it it seems to me we could get carried away and get all sorts of things like anything that's happening during COVID. You know, it's like okay, what does Day of the Dead look like during COVID? And maybe that's still interesting and something that we should preserve. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you could, you know, what is we got the grocery store, you know, I mean, you could kind of get carried away and have, you know, examples of everything and maybe that's okay, but, you know, I can see how you could sort of get carried away or get overwhelmed with, you know, every little bit of uh, minutia. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, some people sent in photos of their dogs and I <laughs> decided that photos of dogs were not really connected as far as I could tell to what was going on now. So I politely declined those and photos of birds and things like that. So I tried to focus it on really the, the issues that we're dealing with now. I mean, to me almost, you know, like the fires, it's not hitting Longmont exactly, but there's, you know, the issues with the smoke and some of that kind of thing. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, those, those things are all happening in a different situation because of the virus. So maybe some of that is, I don't know. I'm sure you'll figure out what we should have, but uh, <laughs> it could be broad if we're not careful. Okay, was that the end? Um, sorry, I don't have. The there are a couple more accessions, so if we could go back to the uh, um, PowerPoint and we can go to the next page. All right, so these are now non-COVID non related, more, more historical uh, documents. So we have a uh, certificate issued by the Longmont Flying Service in 1945, um, which is, is kind of cool. Just, just before they opened Longmont Municipal Airport, um, they were in existence. Um, and then the next one on this page is um, uh, two maps of Boulder County. It, it, I was having a hard time that one of them is extremely large. I mean, it's about five feet uh, long, so a little hard to see in this, but uh, quite a nice map uh, from 1902 in Boulder County. And then the other one that you can just sort of see off in the distance there in this photo is a 1976 map, which um, was just after kind of a, a rationalized and, and uh, standardized all of the street names in Boulder County. So one of the first ones where every road in, in the county had a name. Um, and I believe next slide will be our last. Eric, I have a quick question about the large map. Who uh -huh. printed it? I mean, what is the origin of it? So it, um, it came from, uh, was hanging in the Longmont City Hall for many years. I 
have to confess, I actually have not yet completely unrolled it to see the um, name of the publisher, but it looks to me like it might be a drums map. Henry Drum was a local map maker, mm -hmm. um, made a number of uh, Boulder County and, and St. Brain Valley maps in, in that time period. And this one has that style, but I, I confess. Thank I you. Unroll it. So. And um, the last uh, last item is um, there's a very interesting uh, typed manuscript, uh, the author's experience with uh, working with Great Western Sugar uh, for you know 60 years, really from from being a, a young boy in 1915 all the way up uh, to 1975. Uh, the frustrating thing is he never gives us his name, but he does at one point mention his father's name is J.F. Gerald. So we know he is a son of, of J.F. Gerald, but beyond that, not 100% certain uh, who wrote it, but still fascinating uh, information. Um, then a program from the Potpourri Players, um, now a Longmont Theater Company uh, from 1979 and uh, a pamphlet, uh, Making History with Lamb, uh, that was also owned by the, all owned by the same, same woman, uh, Barbara Connor, um, who's uh, lived in Longmont for many years. So, um, that, that is all of the uh, accessions. Uh, any questions on, on any of those? Uh, Thanks, Eric, and thanks everybody for comments and questions. I think that's very helpful to um, for us to talk about some of these things um, as they come up, so that we're all on the same page. Um, is there a motion to um, uh, accept these accessions? I move that we accept the accessions. And is there a second? I second. I second. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, Rio, we'll let you second. Um, all in favor of accepting the these accessions entirely? Say aye, please, or raise aye. your hand, or wave, or aye. whatever our new thing is. Um, those opposed? Okay, so that's a unanimous approval of those accessions. Thank you. And now, oh, there she is. Um, Kim, if you'd like to give us your report, that'd be great. I'd be happy to. Hi, everybody. Um, this is part of the packet that Joanne shared with you. So um, I, I won't go, I won't read every word of it for you like I, I typically do, but I will try to get some of the highlights for you. Um, we, I think that we let you guys know a while back that we had applied for and received a museum assessment program, which is a um, assessment that happens through the um, American Alliance of Museums and the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the Friends of the Longmont Mu Museum paid for that um, assessment for us. And then of course we had coronavirus hit. So it's been weird, I will say, um, but we have uh, basically completed all of the work on the um, assessment. It starts with a self-assessment. So as a staff and a few outside um, folks like Eve joined us for a couple of those meetings, we had um, a whole series of um, questions that we answered and, um, and for the self-assessment part of it. And then we submitted all of that information to peer reviewers and so then we had to try to figure out how we were going to work with our peer reviewers through um, the pandemic. And we were lucky that one of them is from Colorado Springs. And so he actually was able to join us for a day. Um, and then the other uh, peer reviewer is from the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth. And so he was remote. Um, but I do think that we got some really, really good work done. Um, a lot of, um, you know, hard questions were asked and diving into some real um, nuts and bolts of who we are and who our visitors are. Um, and so they will take all of that information and the two of them will write a, a report for us. Um, and so we've really just finished that process. Susie was part of um, one of the last meetings that we had. Um, I think they've been very productive um, uh, sort of information gathering. 
um, meetings. And so they will then uh, issue a report and some suggestions. And they've said very clearly that there's nothing that stands out that we are doing poorly, um, but it's just a matter of getting some um, outside uh, perspective and some other profession professionals in the field to kind of uh, look at what we're doing and give us some pointers on how to go to the next level. For us, really the next level is gonna be um, looking at how we can get accredited by the American Alliance of Museums. And so this is one step in that process. And I think that there'll be um, some really pointed recommendations as far as that goal um, goes. And so we're looking forward to that. Um, let's see, on to the marketing and membership portion of that report. We um, sent out, you probably most of you got something in your mail, um, uh, which was an annual appeal that we really focused on coronavirus recovery. And so from that annual appeal, we've gotten about $6,200 so far. So that's great. Um, the very first night that that appeal went out, we got a thousand bucks through PayPal. So it was a, a nice um, entree into that um, endeavor. And then we've also gotten um, another grant of $3,000 from the Community Foundation Serving Boulder, and that's for um, the Dia de los Muertos. And then also another 1,500 from Boulder County Diversity Funds for Dia de los Muertos. So we've actually been doing quite well with um, with some grants this year. So we're we're pretty thrilled about that because it's also a way that we'll be able to um, kind of offset some of the losses that we've seen with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. In our education department, we really are all over all Day of the Dead all the time. Um, and so you may have uh, participated in the virtual opening reception that happened um, at, when we, we opened the exhibit. Um, which was very, very, I was tearful, like everybody was crying. It was so meaningful. <laughs> you know, it was, it was hard, hard to keep it together. It was so meaningful. Um, so that was really fun. We did a virtual opening, which was the first time we've ever done anything like that before. So there were some glitches that I think we pulled it off and it came across as very authentic. So that was kind of, I think it worked out okay. Um, and then the rest of the celebration is also going to be a virtual um, festival. And so that's going to end up being um, there's a, a kind of repository of different programs that will have um, that that kind of expand even on what we've been doing in past years for Day of the Dead. And then we've got um, we also did our first virtual school school tour for the Day of the Dead exhibition. Um, you all might know that we have um, typically our um, exhibit gets a lot of attention by um, school groups that come in. And this year, of course, that's very difficult to do. So Anne's been able to do these as a virtual school tours. So that's gonna, I think, kind of roll out even, even bigger later. Um, she's also spearheaded 500 Dia de los Muertos kits um, and distribution starts tomorrow. Um, and basically those are, those include all kinds of different things that you could do at your home um, to celebrate Day of the Dead. And so it, it, it's sort of a, an easy, quick way to get all the materials and, and festivities that you need to celebrate Day of the Dead. So I'm picking mine up, you guys should too. They are gonna be available at the museum, at the library, and then a few other locations as well. Those support folks, let me know, I'll get um, a location for you. Um, we've also, uh, with the um, grant that we received from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we've hired Scott Yoho as a digital communications specialist. And so he's been working very hard on the, that activity with the content for Dia de los Muertos and a lot of other things. Um, Courtney Pletcher is also new to us. She is actually a VISTA volunteer. Um, and a VISTA volunteer uh, um, uh, is uh, someone that we contract with basically for one year. And she will um, be working with Anne in the education department. Um, and so she's working right now on the project that we are um, collaborating with, with the school district, um, with Mobile Lab. You may recall, uh, boy, I've totally lost track of time. But we received, or we um, gave $25,000 to the school district from the museum as a sponsorship for the Mobile Lab. And part of that arrangement is that we will have content on the mobile lab and we will be, there will be um, uh, collaborations that are gonna happen kind of for a three or four year period. And so that was, you know, it was on hold for a while because of, because of coronavirus and now we're getting it kind of moving again. So we're, we're working on that. And what they're 
trying to do um, is to get a project going with fourth grade social studies students um, and their standards. And so they're, they're targeting um, topics that are hard histories, if you will, like uh, the Amanche Japanese internment camp, um, the Sand Creek Massacre, Buffalo Soldiers, that sort of thing, and hoping to be able to create some programs that are um, able to deal with those hard topics in a way that kids can really um, come away with some good lessons. So then, uh, um, going on the Discovery Days, this is really exciting to us. I mean, there's so many things that are silver linings through all of this, and, and I think students is one of those because it's a virtual program and it's totally sold out. So they're doing 80 kits per month and there's a waiting list for it. So this has been a raging success. and We're very excited to be able to do these. Um, Anne and Lee have really come up with some creative um, um, shifts for that program. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's showing that people are responding to it. So we're really excited about that. And then on to Eric's section, um, you guys know that uh, Elizabeth Bodwin has left us as the museum technician, um, and she, she left to uh, take on a curator's role. Um, so we wish her the best, um, but one of the things she was working on when she was with us is um, uh, the Innovative Women in Longmont on a virtual tour, the walking, app, the walking tour on the virtual app. That's what this means, virtual app. Um, so she was working on that, and now that she's gone, Scott Yoho is going to pick up that project, and so we'll be able to finish that out. Um, Eric's also got volunteers that are coming in um, to the archives. We've we're finally um, been able to bring volunteers back into our offices, um, but he's making sure that everybody is socially distanced and he's staggering things so that um, no one is, is is being put at risk at all. Um, Eric has got two sets of proof for his book, and so we're expecting that to show up soon. You guys may have seen that those are available uh, for pre-sale even now. Um, and then I think we're going to try to get them in a couple of bookstores even. So that's going to work out really nicely. We're excited um, for that to show up any day now, sometime in November, it should be here. Um, Eileen has done condition reports for outgoing and in incoming artwork for the um, exhibits that we've done with COVID. Very much very fun, and the day for that is in the galleries. And you should really take a look at it if you haven't already. Um, like we've explained before that basically half the gallery is Tony Ortega's work, and half the gallery is the altars for the Day of the Dead. And it's one of the best I've ever seen. It's, I mean, it's such a great, great ex exhibit. And it's also augmented by a mural that Tony Ortega did downtown. And so that was installed um, just on Friday. Um, so as you're driving by on Main Street, you should be able to see that in one of the breezeways. So we're excited about that. Oh, let's see, what else? Um, Eric's been leading a walking tour. So again, socially distanced and masked, but we're able to do those in person. So you know, the outdoors, which makes that a little bit easier um, to be able to, to adhere to the restrictions. Um, but of course, we've always got great um, uh, people are, are itching to take those tours with Eric, so he's he's done four of those. Um, and then we also finished out um, the two-year-long year long IMLS um, grant that helped us move the collections out to the new storage facility. And so that was um, sort of the final work that Elizabeth Bodwin did um, to, to finish up that um, grant. And it we successfully moved and rehoused over 11,000 objects and photographs and over 8,500 objects. So it was a big job and they were really, really thorough in doing it. So that's very cool. And one of these days we're gonna have you guys come visit, but as soon as we got the official occupancy certificate, we a, a, a pandemic hit. So we haven't been able to actually bring you guys out there one of these days party out at the collection center. So exhibits I've already talked about a little bit. Maybe I'll just move on. Um, Tony Ortega has been a dream to work with. So he, um, er, uh, Jared included some quotes in there from uh, Tony. Um, and then he also included a note that for the first time in six months, the ex exhibition department did not have to make any barriers. He and um, Brack have been 
cranking out plexiglass barriers for um, offices all over the city of Longmont um, to help protect people from the coronavirus. So I think that work is kind of coming to an end, but we were sort of the, the default for being able to fabricate those things. So they really stepped up to the plate, which is appreciated, I'm sure, by everyone. And then one other little note there that we are um, also working with the Colorado State University on um, borrowing some printmaking materials for the upcoming Impressionist exhibit. So basically those are, um, the Impressionist show will feature prints from the Impressionist period. And we wanted to try to demonstrate the process of printmaking. So we're gonna be borrowing some collections from CSU for that. So that'll be um, kind of cool, I think, to be able to see how the process works. And then you see there um, the auditorium updates. We've had um, some really great successes in terms of moving those programs to an online format. Um, we have had a handful of um, members who are coming in person to see some of those things because we have to limit the number of people that are in the auditorium. And then we also did have an in-person frequent flyers aerial dance event. Um, and so that was kind of a staggered attendance um, and bringing uh, your small groups of people through the museum. And that was very successful. Um, let's see. Total of 19 programs that were live streamed. And those 19 programs were viewed 25,000 times. So another silver lining for us is that despite having to take these um, events online, what we're seeing is that we're getting a lot of engagement and you know there's no way we would have been able to host this many people in person um and so it's it is a very very nice thing to be able to have these big that, that number of people that are joining us virtually and from all over the world they're they're joining us so that's nice too we have Peter parker robinson with us um and then the day of the dead opening reception was also virtual we have had a couple of very small rentals um, and we're getting some inquiries about additional ones. Um, and so, you know, again, we're limited in our capacity, um, but we're making sure that we're keeping people at a distance when we are able to do those in-person uh, facility rentals. And then in terms of the sponsored programs, um, we worked with the Centennial State Ballet on their fall showcase to do um, some filming for them. Is there a question? No. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, the October events have included uh, Colorado po Poet Laureate Bobby Lefebvre, which was um, quite a cool program. Activists and Allies was a conversation with a couple of professors with a moderator talking about social justice and the history of race. Um, and then tomorrow is um, a program called Stranger Than Fiction which is really um, a conversation with several fiction writers, um, kind of uh, reflecting on what we're living or living through at the moment. Um, and so uh, uh, really just a kind of um, uh, reflection of how, you know, what's happening during this very, very strange time in our history. And then on the 29th, it's gonna be a program about 100 years of women's suffrage, celebrating the um, suffrage movement and um, women's suffrage, uh, um, and so that I think is gonna be a really cool program. We're trying to get um, Patty Limerick to join us for that. That's not, that's inside information at this point, but we're working on getting her um, on the panel as well. So that'll be a cool one. So then in, for the visitor services section there, um, we had, we've, our numbers, our visitors have not been um, high. So 136 visitors in September. Um, the number of visitors is down from August, um, as we've been in Spring Day the past few weeks, that so we were closed, or basically closed for a couple of weeks. Um, we did, we had very little um, visitation while we were doing that um, turnover for the exhibitions. Often people would come and, and knowing that there wasn't anything in the rotating gallery, they would just leave. Um, and so we didn't have a lot of visitors at that time at all, but we did have a really um, great September the 12th, we had 46 people come through and see Terry Maker's exhibit um, before it closed. And then, um, uh, let's see, we had a really, I don't think she included in, in here, but we had um, for the Day of the Dead first free Saturday, we had really big numbers. I think we had something, Jillian, do you remember off the top of your head what Elizabeth said, how many people we had? 
I'm we don't sorry. I, 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 do I, I don't remember either. But it was more than we had to work. It was more than that. Um, and that was that pre Saturday. Okay. We're we're seeing our numbers increase really slowly, but but nicely. Um, let's see. A lot of day of the dead stuff in our gift shop. If you guys are interested in that, including some Tony Ortega's artwork, um, and then working on rec track um, for the uh, maintenance and on the back end. Um, Art in Public Places has a new installation, Ursa Major, by Parker McDonald, and that was installed in the breezeway between Third third and fourth. You may have remembered this piece. It was actually um, on the tree grate, probably right around third and fourth along Main Street. Um, and we had borrowed it for the um, Art on the Move program. And so it was installed for a year. Um, and then everybody loved, there was such great feedback about that sculpture that the Art and Public Places Commission um, decided to buy that piece. And so it's now a permanent part of the collection and it's um, permanently installed there. We also had um, that collaboration uh, between us and Art and Public Places for the um, Dia de los Muertos mural that Tony created for us. And there were 70 over 70 community members that helped complete that work. So that was a very, very fun project to, to work on. And then the last one there is the Art and Public Places Task Force um, is looking for new sites for three pieces, uh, which we'll need to relocate as a result of the Resilient St. Rain project. Um, and so there will be searching for new sites for that. That's all of the report. Does anybody have any questions for me on that? No. All righty then. Thanks, everybody. Great, thank you. Kim, I don't know what happens if it's when you get closer to your microphone or what, but we kind of get garbled sound. So I don't know if it's your connection or um, sometimes it's fine, sometimes it isn't. So I don't know. Like right now, I can't understand you at all. I'm not sure why I'm doing that. What? <laughs> Read the report. How's that? That's great. Okay. Thank you. And let me know if you have questions. Great. Thank you. I do not have a report. Um, I don't think we have any old business. So we'll move right into new business. Kim, unless you want to take a, a drink of water or something. <laughs> Since you've been talk. Okay, you have to unmute too. Yeah. Okay. So um Joanne shared a couple of draft versions of this um, executive summary. And then I shared right before the meeting in your um, email box, you should see a, a sort of more pulled together, um, but still draft version of this executive summary. And for those that especially who weren't with this, um, when we were working on our strategic planning process, we hired, this has been several years ago now, we hired, um, a guy named Mark Orphan, who um, does a process, a strategic planning process that he called Strat Ops, which is basically a combination of strategic and operational, um, to work on helping us uh, develop the plan. And we went through that process and came up with a lot of um, initiatives that we wanted to work on as a, as a, a staff, as a group. And what we discovered in doing all of that is that we it was it internally we still found it difficult to talk about it and so what we realized that we needed was a more kind of executive summary that pulled together all of the work that we had done through stratops and so um, that's what i'm sharing with you now um, it really is a, a draft and i welcome your feedback um, i would like to have uh, a adopt this at our next um, advisory board meeting. And so I would like to give you a little bit of time to spend with it and review it. I think it may be useful, and I will do this, um, to look at those strategic planning uh, documents as well, um, so that you get a little bit more background about what this, what this executive summary is rising. Again, I think some of you um, 
we, you saw some of that information, but not everybody did. So I want to make sure that everybody is on the same page with the Strata project. Um, so I don't know if there's any initial feedback that anybody might have had based on, on uh, the time that you've already been able to look at this. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Please. I just have one question. So um, just as sort of a, a general kind of a thing, the strategic plan from 2016 to 19, which is available on the museum website, was in a, you know, what I would say is fairly slick kind of presentation form. I'm, I'm assuming that this plan is something that gets, or a plan is something that gets shared when we are writing grants or when we're trying to get people to give us money, um, that kind of thing. So one question is the idea for the this new strategic plan to have it eventually be in some kind of format more like that, you know, rather than um, sort of spreadsheet like this. I just was curious, like, is, is there a, um, how do you envision it looking when it's really done? from a document that the Denver Museum of Nature and Science had put together, which really was the form summary type information. Um, and I did want it to look different than that the previous plan. Um, but certainly, I think it needs a little bit more graphic design work on it. Thanks. I just was curious. I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know what, you know, every museum strategic plan looks like, you know, or what funders are going to be expecting or whatever, I would assume, so long as it's got information about what our plan is, you know, maybe it doesn't matter too much if it's super slick. Right. The, um, the thing, the trend that we are seeing is that plans have, are more like this, that what they are doing is they are looking at key measures and they're looking at updates, continual updates. And they're meant to be living documents instead of things that are just sat on a shelf somewhere. And so if, if you start to look at additional plans, this is what I'm seeing over and over again, is that the trend really is to have more of these sort of graphs and charts. Okay, that's great. Yeah, I don't have that background. So that's, that's helpful. Um, so thank you. Anybody else have questions? Thanks, everybody. If you wouldn't mind just spending a little bit of time with it, we'll revisit it again at the next um, board meeting and hopefully we can stop it. And um, there are some things that I am waiting for yet from the friends. Um, so you'll see some kind of placeholders in there. Um, but certainly if you've got things that you think we need to add or if a change or something's not clear, just let me know because it's meant to be a tool for communication. So if you don't understand it, then that's a problem. <laughs> okay. <You> need to <laughs> that's great. So if we have questions, can we email you? Is that okay? All yeah. right, cool. All right, if, uh, does anybody have any comments with regard to that or other comments or? um i don't know anything okay great well then um is there a motion to adjourn okay a motion um, to adjourn second <laughs> okay thank you very much tom and chris and all in favor of adjourning raise your hand Hi. Do something. Okay, great. Thank you. All opposed. Okay, so everyone is in favor of adjourning and I thank you all very, very much for your time um, and all your comments. And I think um, this is still a little strange, but um, I think we're doing okay. So thank you. Have a good evening. You're doing great. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Bye.